Good day. Today is May 5th, 2022. I'm Derek Fildebrandt, publisher of the Western Standard. Today, I'm sitting down with Max Fawcett. He is the lead columnist for Canada's National Observer. Um, Max had me on his show, actually, uh, a few months back, which was an interesting take. Uh, Max is, uh, at least I think to uh, viewers of this show, uh, would be considered definitely on the left side of things, but not so crazy left as you might think. And we had, And he had me on to get a different point of view. And I wanted to return uh, the favor or the pain, depending on how <laughs> you look at it, um, and have him on uh, for, for his turn on, on the Western Standard here. We're going to talk about uh, kind of follow from the election, in particular focusing on the NDP. Do they have a path to actually form government in Alberta? What direction should they go? Should they kind of go back to the more hardcore uh, democratic socialist roots, or do they continue in their path of pushing towards the center to try and win that sweet spot in Calgary. We're also going to talk about the future of the media. He, he uh, is representing Canada's National Observer, an independent media player on uh, the Canadian scene, uh, just coming at things from a bit, bit of a different angle. And so I think uh, his perspective is, uh, is one that we need to hear. Uh, before we get going, though, I want to thank my favorite sponsor, the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. I've been a member of the CSSA for more than a decade because I trust them as Canada's leading firearm owner's rights group uh, to protect my right to uh, to purchase, own, and use firearms responsibly in Canada. If you're not yet a member of the CSSA, go to cssa-cila.org, or do what I do, just Google them and become a member today. All right, Max, uh, well, thank you very much for coming in. Thanks for having me in. It's a I, pleasure. Thank you. Well, I, I enjoyed our little uh, back and forth last time. It, um, it was surprisingly refreshing, and I think it's good... Um, that we break out of our own silos. And that's what you're trying to do with your show, Maxed Out. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I'm trying to do to you today, is uh, expose our, our, our listeners, our viewers, to perspective uh, that is probably outside of their silos and outside of mine. Uh, so let's just kind of talk, uh, we'll probably focus less on the UCP today, although if you have a, have a tangent you want to go down, feel sure. free to do it. Um, but I want to talk in particular about uh, the NDP and their path forward. Uh, by popular vote, this was actually their best election ever. Uh, they significantly exceeded their popular vote. Uh, at the time they formed a government, 2015, uh, the NDP had only 40.6% of the vote. Uh, they, uh, this time around, uh, they hit 44%, a significant increase, but that's not the way the math works. Popular vote doesn't win elections. Seats do. Mm -hmm. um, now, a column uh, you recently wrote in the National Observer, uh, you pointed out that there were just 2,611 votes in six ridings in Calgary alone that could have flipped it to a bare NDP majority government. Although a similar number exists on the other side that would turn a reasonable UCP majority into a very big UCP majority. But uh, there's no doubt that it was a, there were a couple of key ridings where it was so razor thin that it could have flipped uh, the other way around. Um, but the NDP has... I mean, their, their path to a majority government was so Calgary. Um, outside of Calgary, they hit only one of, uh, no, two of their target seats. Uh, Banff, Kananaskis, which is, on the map looks rural, but isn't really a rural. It's, a, it's very much an asterisk constituency. And Sherwood Park proper. Just those two. Just, they got completely destroyed in the donut outside. And they were just totally uncompetitive in rural Alberta. Uh, just kind of talk about the broader math. Is there a, really, a, as strong as the NDP did here, is there really a path for them to form government in Alberta short of winning about two-thirds of Calgary? I think there is, but it does involve them winning, like you said, two-thirds of Calgary. There, there are communities in, in this province that, you know, are theoretically rural, or they're, you know, certainly on the map outside of rural Calgary. And smaller, and Edmonton. But, yeah. but like, you know, uh, Medicine Hat, Lethbridge East, uh, Red Deer... Grand Prairie, even Fort McMurray, that these are all communities that have cities, have, you know, they are a little more urban, a little more developed. And I think the NDP's message could resonate there. Um, you know, I flagged it for them from the very beginning, months before the, before the writ dropped, that they needed to be able to speak to Calgarians in their language. And the language in Calgary is the economy. It's jobs, it's prosperity, it's the economy. And I don't think that ever really sunk in. Um, you know, they, they did some consulting. They, they you know, talk, they had plans. They brought Todd Hershen, who was the former chief economist at ATB. So there were steps in that direction. But 
there was no narrative. There was no story that they were telling Calgarians about their economic future. The story was all about healthcare. Uh, it was about certainly a little bit about climate. I would say not enough, but that's a whole other story. It, and it was a lot about Daniel Smith. It was about leadership. Um, it was, I think, a very negative message. I think, you know, obviously other people have, have identified that as a problem, although I will say the UCP's campaign was just as negative. I mean, politics tends to be negative these days, especially with, with leaders like Rachel Notley and Daniel Smith. But the NDs could have told an economic story, and they didn't. They actually ended up helping the UCP tell their economic story when they dropped the corporate tax increase in the middle of the campaign. I mean, we've seen, uh, I think Don Braid had a column about it. I wrote about it. I don't think anyone understands what they were thinking. Um, it's, I was on Ryan Jesperson's show last week. I called it the biggest, one of the biggest blunders in Canadian political history. And it was because what it did is it confirmed the belief that a lot of people have about the NDP. Fair or not, that they are blunderers when it comes to the economy. And I think from that yeah. point on, uh, it was smooth sailing for the UCP. So uh, it's kind of a post-mortem here, but I, I guess let's talk about the corporate tax increase maybe as maybe a broader, uh, maybe a bellwether issue mm -hmm. uh, for where the NDP goes from here. Uh, yeah, it hurt them, I think, with a lot of uh, business-conscious Calgary voters. I think the NDP make the mistake of thinking that Unless you are the CEO of a corporation, you don't care about corporate taxes. And in general, most people are in favor of high taxes on other people, just not for themselves. And while most people aren't directly paying corporate taxes and they don't really understand how that might filter down into the broader business climate and cost of living, that kind of thing. But part of me was also thinking, if the NDP didn't run on raising corporate taxes, what's the point of the NDP? <laughs> like, because I'm trying to put myself uh, you know, in the eyes of, a, of, of, an, of an NDP voter, no, not someone who's right in the middle, because you know, parties are coalitions. And you, know, you're, you have to buy a la carte. You have to buy the whole thing. It's not a buffet. It's a la carte. You have to take the whole thing. Uh, was it wrong, for, just from an electoral perspective, if the NDP didn't have that, there, there wouldn't have been a lot of that was kind of the red meat for, for the NDP voter. Didn't they still need to do that to still stay New Democrats? Well, you'll notice that, that Daniel Smith didn't give any red meat to her base. You know, the whole election campaign was when she was actually out in public talking to the media, which was not very often. But their message was completely vegetarian. It was, we're going to protect health care. We're not going to, you know, relitigate covid and we're going to be good for the economy. They stayed away from their red meat. So I don't know why the NDP thought that they needed to serve up a big piece of their red meat to their base. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they seem to be trying to pass a test that no one was marking them on, which is, can you balance the budget? It's the same mistake that Tom Mulcair made in 2015, right? He said, you know, when the polls showed they were in the lead, he came out and he said, we're going to balance the budget. We're going to be responsible. And the liberals just went right around to the other side of them and said, well, we'll run deficits. And they got elected. Canadians don't care about balanced budgets as much as I think some people wish they did. I, I agree with you, but I mean, it, it is Alberta and we're not as conservative as the stereotype would have it. But I think voters here are still more conscious of physical management, economic management than, than in other parts of the country, oh, at sure. least proportionately. And I, I don't think core New Democrat voters particularly care, but I mean, that, uh, that sweet spot, you know, those swing voters, the soccer moms... Uh, to use the overused uh, demographic in Calgary, yeah, a lot of them do, I think. And, and, and the NDP was uh, still seen as a risky option for many. I think they care less about whether the, the budget is balanced than they care about whether the economy is in good hands. And I think those two things are separate because, as we've seen um, you know, over the last few years, the UCP wasn't any better at balancing the budget than the NDs until they got this giant windfall of oil and gas revenue and, and honestly, like a, a blind monkey could have balanced that budget last year. It was, there was so much non-renewable resource revenue. Um, mm -hmm. They didn't know what to do with it. I think it's more that the soccer moms, the, the sort of voters that the NDs are trying to win over, they want to know that the tide is going to stay in. They want the rising tide. And I think that's where the corporate tax thing comes into play. You're right that most people maybe don't understand how it filters down to their jobs. What does it mean if you cut taxes? What does it mean if you raise them? But they understand when things are good in Calgary for the corporate sector, when, you know, when the oil and gas companies are doing well, I tend to do well. Mm -hmm. My kids tend to do well. And I think they make that 
correlation more strongly, even the people in downtown Toronto, you know, downtown Toronto has way more towers than Calgary does. Um, the people in downtown Toronto don't identify with the corporate sector the way people in Calgary do. And I know that frustrates New Democrats, especially frustrates the ones up in Edmonton. But that's just the way it is. It, you know, politics is not fair um, and they have to play the hand they're dealt. And I really think with the corporate tax increase that they floated the mid-campaign, they played the wrong hand. So I think the, um, you know, historically, if you got, so the UCP got 52.6% of the vote here. Historically, that yields you a massive majority government. I mean, it is not the highest vote share in Alberta history, but it's in the top few. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, uh, so, you know, compared to uh, 2019, the UCP got 54.9% of the vote with Kenny. Yeah. Uh, they went down barely two points, 52.6%. That should have, if, you know, if, if all the other non-UCP votes had stayed the same, that would have roughly cost them two seats, three yep. seats. It, it would have been inconsequential. I think the clear difference in this campaign is that the NDP has hyper-consolidated the left, for lack of a better term. They did it mostly in 2015 when they collapsed the liberals behind themselves. Uh, they finished digesting them in 2019. <laughs> liberals lost the remnant of their vote, and they lost their last seat. Um, this time, they ate the Alberta party. So in, in when the NDP lost power and Kenny won in 2019, uh, the NDP uh, had gone down to 32.7% of the vote. The Alberta party had 9.1%. The Alberta party collapsed, not even collapsed, just disintegrated to 0.7% this time, and the NDP came up to 44 So they yeah. pretty much just ate the Alberta party uh, alive. This is the last time we're ever going to talk about the Alberta Party. I'm sick of the media always talking about these guys because uh, it's, it's just a weird media fascination that some have with them. I think we could finally take them off the table. Um, uh, but to keep, uh, I guess we have a, it's a new, interesting, new Democrat coalition. Um, and by, by consolidating there, though, they, they've made it such a, comp they've made it competitive, even though the UCP vote pretty much stayed. Mm -hmm. Smith brought those wild rosers back in that had been fleeing the tent under Kenny. And almost entirely, she kept the PCs there. Like the, the UCP vote held, it's just that the vote, the non-UCP vote completely changed. Um, how do you think the NDP holds that coalition together going forward? That's the challenge. Um, that's the big challenge for them. And, and, and sorry, and expand it. Yeah, they, they, I mean, they've been very successful in that part. I mean, I, I'm always... Um, skeptical of narratives coming from losing parties in elections saying, well, you know, it was a moral victory because of X, Y, and Z. There are no moral victories in politics. You either win or you lose. Um, and they lost. But it is a success that they have collapsed all of the non-conservative parties around them. I think that is probably a fairly permanent fixture. If there's going to be any leakage from the NDP, I suspect it'll be on their left. Um, not, the, the not Greens towards were the middle. technically the third place party. Yeah, exactly. So that I mean that that is a very new dynamic in Alberta politics. That sort of centrist uh, part of the part of the electorate, which has bounced around between the Alberta Liberals. They flirted with the Alberta Party, and you know, I was guilty of that. I liked the idea. Um, it's all orange now. Um, you know, I think there are some good things for them in the next little while. There's more people mo moving to Calgary, moving to Alberta. They tend to be moving into the places where the NDP is strong. They tend to be moving from parts of the country that are a little less conservative. We have a redistricting com coming up in the next few years, which will add a few more seats to sort of the downtown parts of, uh, or the more urban parts of Alberta. So that should expand their map, um, such as it is. But there's still, there still seems to be a hard ceiling there, right? There still seems to be about five or six points between structurally where they are and structurally where the conservatives are. And they got to figure out how they bridge that. Uh, I think part of that is spending more time in the left bridges, the red deers, the medicine hats. They have to grow their map in those parts of the province. Um, and part of it is telling a better economic story. They have to be better at speaking that language. I know they don't like practicing it. It's like, you know, when you're in elementary school and you have French homework, you don't want to do it. Well, too bad. You got to learn how to speak French if you want to win an election in this province, French being the economy. Um, I think they have to hope that the, the right fragments. Um, I think 
Daniel Smith has done a very masterful job, like you said, of knitting everything together, the sort of further right portion, the, the Wild Rose Independence Party vote came together under her. You know, she's, she really has done a better job of that, I think, than most people expected. The question is whether she can do it under more difficult circumstances. You know, she came into power when everything was good, right? The, the mandates were rolling off, economy was getting stronger, biggest budget surplus in Alberta history, oil and gas prices going through the roof. It's hard to screw up when you keep winning the lottery. It'll be a different story, I think, when she faces some harder tests. And she has kind of tipped that hand already when she talked about, you know, when she was ex- explaining her comments during COVID, the, the Nazi stuff, the unvaccinated people or the most discriminated people in history stuff. She said, well, it was, it was the pandemic. I was having a hard time. Like everyone was kind of at a raw edge. What happens when she has another raw edge? How does she react to it? How does she respond? I, I'm not sure we know. And I think her response to harder times will tell us whether the conservative coalition in Alberta remains united mm-hmm. or whether it pulls apart again. And if it pulls apart, the NDP is going to win the next election. Governing is almost certainly more difficult than campaigning. And uh, you've pointed out your column, and I've pointed out, I think, in every column I've written the last year, conservative leaders in Alberta have a very short shelf life. If she could even make it to the next election campaign, uh, well, that'd be the first time since I think the two of us were in high school that any conservative <laughs> has done it. Um, I want to point uh, to uh, some uh, paragraph from your column here of uh, May 31st. Are, uh, titled, Rachel Notley's NDP needs to finish the job, kind of playing on something that she said uh, on election night. Mm-hmm. You said there will be retur- uh, calls for a return to the NDP's more ideologically strident past, where catering to suburban Calgary voters was never much of a consideration. They'll argue a more authentically left-wing party, one that campaigns more aggressively on climate change and social justice uh, when alienate young voters they need. That would be an even bigger mistake. So I want to kind of talk about the, the paths for here. Um, the conventional wisdom in Canadian politics and most places is you win in the center. And that is sometimes true, but very often not. Um, you know, when conservatives lose elections, they generally draw one of two conclusions. We moved too far to the center and didn't energize our base. Or two, we went too far to the right and alienated middle of the road voters. And uh, every election, Generally, half of conservatives draw one conclusion, the other draw, half draw the other conclusion. Um, you've drawn the conclusion that the NDP needs to continue to tack into the center. And I, I mean, this being Alberta, that's probably true. Um, but that's, I want to give some airing to the argument that maybe they didn't juice up their base enough. They could have turned out more people if they had um, given them more of a cause to vote for them than just a cause to vote against the NDP. Because clearly, if we end up in a, the NDP ends up in a leadership contest here, there's going to be people on from representing both wings of that party making both arguments. Mm-hmm. Uh, how much of a case do they? You, you've, you, you don't seem to think they have a good case, but uh, is there anything to it? I mean, yeah, I don't buy the case that they, they needed to throw more red meat to the base. Uh, no, you know, cards on the table. I am a constitutionally a liberal, right? I'm, I'm a centrist. I'm a, I tend to be a more moderate person. So the idea of firing up your base to win elections has never really kind of resonated with me. I, I think if you look at the ridings where they almost won and the ridings where they barely won, there's not a lot of young people there. There's not a lot of uh, people in their sort of traditional base that needed to be fired up. It's a lot of like you said, soccer moms. It's a lot of families. It's a lot of uh, people who work in downtown Calgary, but you know, commute out to the suburbs. These are not people who sort of strike me as, as uh, NDP radicals or firebrands. I, you know, I think they are people who would vote reluctantly for the NDP. But guess what? A reluctant vote counts just the same as an enthusiastic one. And I think that's where their focus has to be. And you're absolutely right that you know, there's talk about, will Ms. Notley step down? Um, you know, I think in time she probably will. Uh, she's you know, digesting the results. But it seems pretty clear to me that a third campaign, fourth campaign, I guess, with her mm-hmm. as the leader, uh, probably isn't going to change anything. That would that would really be hoping that the Conservatives collapse. And that's what they tried this Which is time. always possible. It is, but, but that was really what they tried to do this time. Mm-hmm. They were waiting for Danielle Smith to fall down, and she didn't. Um, so I would not recommend that as a, as a course of action. So 
as they look forward, do they want a leader who is more sort of to the, the union labor base, environmental base, or do they want someone who's a little more business friendly? And I've heard, so, you know, there's definitely an energy for, for going back to basics, I guess, as they would say, you know, um, there's a, it's interesting. I think conservatives and new Democrats have more in common with each other than they do with liberals because liberals mm. really like to win. Um, and on some level don't really care how they do it, uh, which is either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on where you sit. But conservatives and new Democrats, they have portions in their base that would rather lose with integrity than win by compromising their values. Yeah. And there's a lot of new Democrats who look at this campaign and go, well, what was that all for? Why did we even do that? Uh, you know, we got close to power. We said all these things that we don't believe and, and look where we are. I, I don't think that's the right instinct. I think if they go back, if they pick a leader who is more sort of stridently, ideologically left wing, they can go back to 10 seats in a heartbeat, right? The, the idea that this is sort of their baseline and they're, they're always going to have 45% of the vote. A lot of that vote that it coalesced around them can coalesce somewhere else. It is not bound to them in any way, shape or form. So they need to continue doing the work that they've been doing over the last little while, learn the lessons from the things they didn't do right in this and find a leader who can maybe isn't from Calgary, but can speak to Calgary can speak to Red Deer, can speak to Medicine Hat um, in ways that gets them a better hearing than I think they got in this election. Look, Rachel Notley is incredibly popular in Edmonton. She's less popular here. Um, and I don't think that the NDP entirely understood that. I don't think the NDP brain trust in Edmonton understood that. And I know the NDP campaigners that came from other parts of the country didn't understand that. Um, well, and, and the delta in kind of net favorabilities between Notley and Smith in Calgary, came to almost Denny. nothing by the end. Smith yep. started with a significant deficit, but by the end, they were pretty much a draw. Mm -hmm. And the NDP tried to make the campaign about just leadership, and leadership pretty much netted out. Yep. And at the end of the day, Calgarians are probably going to default to the blue team because it's it's got home ice advantage. 100%. They start the game with yeah. three three goals on the on the score, right? Yeah. Um, yeah it's like me trying to camp, uh, become mayor of Montreal. Uh, uh, Yep. It's a tough climb. It's a tough climb, and, and you, don't, you don't complete those climbs by ignoring the reality of it, you know, and saying, well, I can climb this mountain, no big deal, and then you, you die on the slope, right? And I think the, there's, a, there's still a part of the NDP sort of brain trust that really objects to the state of play in Calgary. They think it's unfair, to which I say, too bad, right? It is what it is. You've done incredibly well compared to where, even in 2015, they did down here. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I think they have more purchase with, uh, a lot of voters than they ever thought they could. You know, the idea of, of a NDP candidate winning in Calgary elbow with no vote split or you know, a minimal vote split is virtually not, yeah. is astonishing, yeah. right? Uh, even in 2015, that wasn't a thing they could do. So they've made gains. Don't flush those gains down the toilet out of frustration. Before we move on to media, I want to get into just leadership sure. really quickly, this is a bit more speculative, I think, because it's more specific individuals. Um, this is going to be kind of a pin the tail on the donkey. I'm going to try to make it just make some wild bets here sure. that you know you're not going to want to make, but I'm going to try and. I love wild bets. Um, you know, I think we have an idea of you know who would be kind of carrying the left banner of the NDP in in a likely leadership contest coming mm -hmm. up. You know, Shannon Phillips, uh, Janice Irwin. Um, uh, they have another uh, Sarah Hoffman. Sarah Sarah Hoffman, and then another uh, one who was just elected in twenty nineteen. Uh, seems very capable. Uh, her name escapes me. Rocky Pancholi. Yeah, yeah, your, your favorite. Yeah, yeah. Um, although she, I'm not sure where she would fit necessarily in the party, but uh, you know, you, you're gonna have your left banner carriers, and then I think there might be outsiders who are not currently MLAs. I'm thinking Nahid Nenshi, Ted Hirsch, people who would put a very different. Um, foot forward mm -hmm. for the NDP that would be, I think, perceived as not tied to the old NDP traditions, uh, would be able, of Calgary itself. Make a wild predict, uh, two things. One, who would be the best dream leader for the NDP uh, from an electoral perspective? And then two, who do you think is going to be, and, and I know that's wild and you're going to be wrong, because yep. it's a wild guess to make. Yeah. Um so I guess I'll start by pushing back a little bit on the way you've categorized them. So I, so full disclosure, I worked for Shannon Phillips, uh, not directly, but 
but in the government of Alberta and her climate change office. Mm -hmm. I don't think she's on the left flank. Uh, well, I know she's not the furthest left. Like she, you know, she was the finance critic. Uh, she's actually been quite, I think, uh, eloquent and effective at talking about the oil and gas industry, at talking about things in a way that are frankly more liberal uh, federally than New Democrats. So I kind of put Shannon in the middle. Um, I'm not sure that she, I'm not sure she wants it, um, but I think having someone outside of Edmonton would be a great idea. Um, you know, Nenshi is sort of like the wet dream that that progressives in Calgary have and have had for a long time. You know, mm -hmm. if we could just get if we could just get Nenshi running the party, it would be amazing. And I think he would be a good leader. Uh, I don't think the, I don't think the NDP would ever accept him. Um, mm -hmm. He he. He would be rejected by that party the same way if you just tried to put a, a you know a, a different species as organ inside a human being. It, it the body would not take to it. Uh, New Democrats are, for better or worse, I think very loyal and very attentive to loyalty. And so if they do not believe that you have been in the party long enough, if you've not paid your dues, if you have not served, uh, they are not particularly interested in being in serving you. So I think. That's one of the problems with the Nenshi name. I also think he's perfect for municipal politics because he can kind of go back and forth. He's not ideologically hemmed in on any one issue. Um, I'm not sure that he would like provincial politics as much as he likes municipal politics. But I'm also not sure he would be good in more of a, the team-based politics of a Westminster system where he has to, you know, as mayor, he speaks for himself. And he can try to corral council around but I, I feel like he'd have a hard time with a, with caucus management. A hundred percent. Yeah, I think he would be impatient uh, in the same way that Pierre Trudeau was impatient with his uh, caucus members. Uh, you know, uh, I think it's the same vibe and I respect the vibe. I just not sure that it's the right fit right now. Now, Todd Hirsch, I mean, if he was going to run, he should have run this time. I love Todd. I think he's very, very smart. He, you know, he's, his policies that he put out for the NDs around the economy, I thought were really I mean, they're, they're what we need. We need to have a conversation about how we get off this roller coaster of being sort of wedded to resource royalties where we, you know, we go from being rich to being broke to being rich to being broke. And I think it would be great if Danielle Smith took a look at some of those and, and maybe incorporated those into her approach to, to managing the economy. But if he was not willing to stand behind those ideas in this campaign, I'm not sure why he would be willing to run for the leadership. In Is the he next the Mark campaign. Carney of the NDP now? A little bit <laughs> in the sense that like he's the one that gets economists really excited. But but when it comes to the sort of rank and file, it's just not there. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think, again, love Mark Carney. Uh, I think as a leader of the Liberal Party, he'd be a disaster. Uh, and I think it would be the, the same thing uh, with any economist. I'm not sure that they have the ability to talk to people and meet people where they are in the way that you need to uh, to be a, to be an effective politician. I think Rocky Pancholi, so she's not, I would not put her on the left. I would put her in the middle. Um, middle of the NDP? Yeah, of the NDP, which, yeah. you know, admittedly for your viewers is, you know, to the left of the Communist Party. But, um, you know, she is, she understands business. She's a lawyer. She, you know, she used to work in the service industry. She knows how to talk to people. She's very likable. Uh, she's not ideological. She's from South Edmonton, so not from that sort of more urban kind of, uh, progressive Edmonton, uh, you know, she has to meet people where they are. She, you know, I've, I've seen her talking to people in Calgary. She, she speaks the language down here. I think she would be very effective. I think the question is whether, you know, the Notley wing of the party is ready to let go of power. And I'm not sure they are. I think they might want to gravitate towards someone like uh, Sarah Hoffman or David Shepard, who is the MLA for Edmonton Center. And I have lots of respect for those people. I think that would be kind of disastrous. Uh, any leader that comes within, you know, who comes from a riding that is within walking distance from Edmonton Strathcona is going to get hammered down here. Um, mm -hmm. There is just a dispositional difference that I think Notley was able to partially bridge because she became premier and had that sort of sheen of, of author authority and, and credibility. But if, if you're sort of a new leader from an urban Edmonton uh, riding, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you connect with people down here. Okay. Well, I, I want to switch gears a bit into media. Um, so, you're, you know, you're lead columnist for Canada's National Observer. Um, before we started recording here, uh, we were talking about how that's actually a fairly 
rare position now uh, in media to have someone who's just full-time columnist. Mm-hmm. Most 99% of columnists in this country are freelancers. Um, so obviously, National Observer is doing something right, uh, and it's an independent. Um, but I mean, it's it's become a trope now that media is just going bust in Canada. It, it's largely a global phenomenon, but in in Canada, it's we're at least not on the light end of a global trend. We're on generally considered to be on the heavy end of it. Yeah. The answer, at least among the powers that be, seems to be uh, that is direct government intervention to support it as an industry in general and, and some outlets disproportionately getting uh, uh, the business end of that uh, more than others. It's been uh, bailouts, uh, which are, I don't know, four years old now, essentially. Um, it's got C- Bill C-18 to kind of reach into the pockets of the tech giants, extract money there, and theoretically hand it to media, although it increasingly looks like there's actually going to be zero dollars to come from that. It's just going to mean less reach to people through social media and Google and things like that. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's probably details uh, that you already disagree with, with the bailout, C-18, and all these things. I'm sure there's, there's details you'd quibble with. But in general, do you think that approach of kind of a, a kind of a traditional Canadian approach to subsidizing an industry that we think is important, is it in general going to work? Oof. So caveat, caveat emptor for your audience, because I'm sure they're wondering. Um, so we do at the National Observer get uh, federal funding through what's called the Local Journalism Initiative. So that's mm-hmm. a program that kind of matches up. Um, funding to reporting in areas that's not being covered or communities that are not being served. I don't get a penny. My work stands on its own. It pays for itself. And then some, uh, I don't get any, none of the federal government's money makes its way into my bank account. So just put that out there. But it pays for certain individual journalists within it, but not yourself. Yet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, the Canadian media is in a tough place because, you know, we don't have the scale of the United States. The United States has, you know, 10 times our population. And so if you're doing an online venture, it's much easier to scale up because you just have a pool of people who are interested in what you're writing about that is 10 times as big. Um, And we don't have the sort of linguistic barriers that you have in Europe where if you're a Dutch media company, there's only only so many people in the world that speak Dutch and they don't exist outside your borders. Generally. You're not going to have to really compete with the French or the Germans. Com- exactly. You're not competing with, never mind uh, a combined France, Germany, you know, like we do with America. So it's, I think in some respects, we have it harder than anywhere else in the world to build a viable media industry. And, you know, so I think the government has been well-meaning in trying to find a way to ensure that we have journalism in this country, because I think whether you're a conservative or whether you're a progressive, there should be some basic agreement that we need journalists asking questions, covering news, and holding people to account. That that is a function that people will not do on their own. You know, you can't do that on Twitter, on Facebook. It requires a skill set that goes beyond the one that most people have. And so we need to find a way to support the business and the activity of news gathering uh, in a way that is non-prejudicial. I think where the concern arises is whether the the way they've done it is de facto prejudicial, right? Now, I would point out... Well, I think there's there's two issues. One is, is it creating undue political pressure in media? And I'm a publisher. I'll tell you, any publisher who says that you don't care about your advertisers, they're lying. Mm -hmm. We, of course, we care about our advertisers. We try to put a firewall between it, but we care. And... But, you know, no one source of revenue for us is more than, I think, 5%. And, you know, the total package of bailouts for a lot of media is now in excess of 33 to 40%. That could theoretically become larger now, over 50% with C18. That's, I, I don't actually, and this, I don't want to talk about the morality mm-hmm. of it. I, I know I, I've talked about that all the time, about how immoral I think it is. But I'm going to talk about more of the economics of it. Can, do you believe in general that direct government support for media, both regulatory and direct financial support, in the end is going to work in propping up Canada's media landscape relatively as it looks today? No, I think what it is doing is slowing the decline. Um, 
I think if you gave policymakers truth serum, uh, I mean, you wouldn't probably start with this, but you would have other questions. But they would say that, you know, this is about supporting the existing infrastructure of, of media until the alternative news media can kind of scale up and, and not replace it, but, but fulfill a lot of the functions that it has failed in the past. Like, you would not start a newspaper company like Post Media uh, if you were doing something from scratch today. You wouldn't have done it 10 years ago mm -hmm. in a lot of respects. But they, I think, understood that if that, in, you know, if all the papers in Edmonton, Calgary, Vancouver, Toronto, never mind the small communities across the country, if they all just collapsed and stopped operating tomorrow, that would do tremendous damage to the communities that they serve. And so they were trying to find a way to kind of keep them on life support until other more sort of robust operations were able to stand up in those communities. Mm -hmm. I think the mistake that they made, and I think it was a mistake from day one, is they, they shouldn't have been subsidizing based on existing scale. They should have been rewarding based on the ability to attract an audience. So if you're a new media company like the Western Standard, like Canada's National Observer, you should have the same access to those subsidies as Post Media, as Tor Star, as the Globe and Mail. The fact that they exist should not give them an advantage over someone who wants to start a new business. Um, and at the end of the day, let the market speak. Um, you know, if, if you can attract 500,000 eyeballs, you should get the support. Um, what the government needs but to then, do... then we're just kind of incentivizing clickbait. But then that, that's kind well, of the damned if you do, damned if you don't, is yeah. no one's reading you, and you're clearly not economically viable. But, I mean, we always have to guard against being overly clickbaity. Yep. Because... Fine, we become economically viable, but then we just become trash. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can't be pure, you know, purely high-minded, you know, highbrow stuff, and you can't be pure clickbait. We always have to be somewhere in the middle. But uh, I think the, I don't think I don't know if there really is a way to fairly do it where we're not. No matter what intervention we make, we're going to be creating disincentives. I think to a natural evolution of the market, no matter which way we go. A hundred percent. But if we, if we don't make these interventions, I think we risk market failure. And I'm not a big fan of market failure. I think markets, when they collapse, can do a lot of damage to the people who are, who are sort of depending on them. Uh, you know, I think back to the banking crisis in the United States. People said, well, we should just let the banks fail. A lot of people's lives on the line there that would have been negatively impacted. So Fair, but th that was kind of a chain reaction through, through a system, whereas I think with this, you know, you were, you were talking about slowing the decline until the alternative emerges. Mm -hmm. But don't you think that by propping up the legacy players, we're retarding the growth of the emerging alternative players to fill it? Because, you know, I have to compete with the Global Mail, the mm -hmm. CBC, Post Media, in salaries for reporters. And they've got a 33% advantage from government subsidies. Um, we don't take it right now, but some days I think, you know, to be competitive, like we're eligible to receive it. We don't. Yeah. But eventually I might have to climb off my high horse here just to compete. And so it seems to be kind of retarding the, the growth of the alternative media to fill it. Because I don't think it's the same as the collapse of, you know, uh, Goldman Sachs, where they go down, everyone else goes down. I think if, you know, if, say, post-media collapsed, I don't think that really affects, it, it'll affect news coverage, but doesn't adversely affect others in the media. It's not like there's a supply chain and yeah. we're all leveraged on each other. I think no, that's fair. There's no someone else comes in. Uh, you know, the, there's no contagion effect. In the exactly. Media. There's no contagion. Yeah. In, in fact, it probably just allows it to reset. It'd be, you know, it's the, the concept of creative destruction and capitalism. Well, I think, I think you're right. I think part of it is that systems are good at supporting the status quo. And so folks like you, folks like us, you know, it's, it's interesting Premier Smith mentioned both of us in the same breath in a press conference a few months ago when she was talking about new media. So, you know, we are sort of in the same pond, even if we're fishing at other ends. But, mm -hmm. you know, when a system is being transformed, the existing incumbent players are going to have a better shot at kind of getting the ear of policymakers than we will, because they, they have the jobs right now. They have the influence right now. We're trying to build that influence. Um, and so I think there's always going to be sort of an overcorrection towards protecting the status quo. And I think you're right. If post media failed, things would probably flowers would grow in the, in the ashes there uh, pretty darn fast. Um, you know, I think this is all linked to a conversation about what we do with the CBC. And I know that's a whole other can of worms. But I think, you know, 
the CBC needs to, and I've said this many, many times, needs to not be in the business of taking advertisements. Um, that is cannibalizing stuff that could very, that's, that's advertising that very clearly wants to go into media, could go to you, could go to us. Um, it should not probably be in the business of producing opinion. Um, I don't think that that helps its image as a neutral sort of serving all Canadians vehicle. I think it tends to uh, exacerbate concerns that people have about bias, about its coverage. I would like to see the CBC go back to sort of a mandate where it focuses on reporting, on doing the reporting that maybe isn't fundable by the, by the market, right? You know, investigative journalism, documentaries, things like that, and, and kind of stay out of the, the areas that are maybe more profitable, but that are cannibalizing profits that could go to new media upstarts. Um, that is probably the most reasonable argument I've heard for keeping the CBC. I'm, I'm still not there, yep. but you're, you're speaking language I can at least hear and understand and say, you know what? I could probably live with it. I, you know, I, I have my fantasies, of course, about you know the building closing and whatnot, but uh, it does have a potential to do good. And I, I, and I think that's, that's probably the best pitch I've heard for the CBC, and it's one that would at least change its perception to make it more politically neutral, I think, less of a football. Yeah, and, and part of that is also addressing the issue of bias. And, and I, I don't think that the CBC exists to lift up liberals and punish conservatives, but I do think that it massively overcorrects towards downtown perspectives. And the perspectives of, you know, the people who work at the CBC, and I love them, God bless them, they all tend to come from the same parts of the city. Mm -hmm. And that's going to self select for a certain political view. You know, journalists tend to be a little more progressive, more liberal, uh, more on the left side of the spectrum, just because of where they come from and their background. And they have to adjust for that. They have to adjust for, um, you know, where their employees come from versus the audience that they're serving. And if they want the audience to be all Canadians, they got to kind of put a little, wa a little water in their wine sometimes. I think you're right on that. I think I generally not along a bit with Pierre Polyev when he bashes the CBC, but I think he's wrong when he says it's liberal party propaganda. I don't think it's propaganda for a party, but I think it is clearly small L liberal or small SD social democratic worldview or ideology just because of its self-selecting criteria. As you said, it's, you know, it's the people who work there are overwhelmingly urban university educated. They check off demographic boxes that, make you extremely likely to vote for and support parties on the left. And yeah. I, 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 so I don't think it uh, consciously serves the liberal party itself, but it, it tends to support its worldview just de facto. And I think that's true of most media in general. I think it's probably particularly acute at the CPC. It's just seen as a bigger issue because it's publicly funded. Yeah. And it, just before we depart the CPC here, um, there's a way to fix this. And it's something that the CBC is very familiar with. It, it's their diversity mandate. So they have, a, they have a diversity mandate. They need to represent multiple backgrounds. So are That's, you saying they need to hire like white rednecks? No, no, no not Brooks? rednecks, not rednecks. But <laughs> I, I, think, I think that, you know, that's super important what they do in terms of making sure that, that their coverage reflects all Canadians. But that also means rural Canada. And so they should have a mandate where they have to have a certain percentage of reporters and editorial staff who grew up in a small town, Right or grew up in a place that wasn't Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, Calgary. And I think that alone, not just on-air talent, but sort of editorial talent, would shift the conversation in story meetings. It would shift the conversation, what do we cover, in a way that I think would be very, very tangible. Um, but, you know, uh, dare to dream. Um, let's maybe look at uh, a bit more on the positive side here. Can you name a couple of the bright spots? Our own two publications aside, our, and our glorious march to, uh, <laughs> to hegemony, uh, what are some of the bright spots or trends you see in kind of the independent media in um, filling the vacuum in a quickly evolving marketplace? Well, I'm not sure there's a ton. I think from, the, from an ownership perspective, with all, due, with all due respect and apologies, it's tough, right? It's tough to make money in this space. Um, I think from a young journalist perspective, I think from a you know, perspective of someone trying to break in to the media, there are fewer barriers than ever. Um, you know, it used to be that you would have to sort of go down this very specific path. You'd have to go to journalism school. You'd have to work at one of the big papers or the CBC. You sort of pay your dues, ba -ba 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 -ba, and eventually you sort of make your way to the top. And now if you're come out, you know, you don't have to go to journalism school. You can just go to university. You can 
finish high school, whatever, and create a brand for yourself based on your content. And if your content sucks, no one will watch it, right? That's the way it works. But if your content's good and it connects with people, you will find an audience. Now, there are dark sides to this because I think there's a lot of people out there that are kind of pandering to the worst instincts of, of society and, uh, and of people out there. But I, I think of a guy named Quick Dick McDick who is uh, out in Saskatchewan, <laughs> oh, yeah. right? We've had, a, we've had him on before. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. like, he and I do, don't agree on, I would say, most things, but he has a perspective. He comes at it with humor, with, with presentation value, um, with, with, you know, with all the right things, and he's found an audience. And that is purely based on merit. Mm -hmm. The CBC didn't do it for him. The Globe and Mail didn't do it for him. School didn't do it for him. He did it for himself. And now he's using that to sort of, you know, bring farm education into schools. And he's doing these cool videos that show kids like, here's how, you know, a combine works. Like, that's great. And, and you can do that on the left too, right? You can make your own brand for yourself. I think of someone, she gets terrible mistreatment on the internet, but someone like Rachel Gilmore, she did work at, at Global, yes, but she created a brand for herself through her work, right? Through her entrepreneurship. And I think if you're a media entrepreneur, uh, this is the best time to be alive, probably in a very, very long time. Not as an owner, not as a sort of corporate owner, but as a entrepreneur of your brand, you know, the, the, the sky's the limit. So that parlays nice into what I think is my last question here, kind of blue sky question. Mm -hmm. What do you think the Canadian media landscape is going to look like in 10 years? Oof. And there's uh, a few ways you could choose to attack that. Yeah. I think post media will not exist. Um, I agree. I think, I think we will have online versions of city papers. Uh, I don't think people are going to be printing newspapers 10 years from now. I think a lot of that is legacy print products and pr legacy print contracts. Uh, that are going to roll off. I'm reminded when I used to work for Vancouver Magazine and we were owned by Yellow Pages. And I remember people asking like, sorry, you're owned by Yellow Pages? That still exists? And it was because advertisers had signed these like 10-year contracts and they were just basically milking them until they rolled off. Once they rolled off, that was the end of that. So I think you're going to see more diversity of, of online urban publications. I think the CBC will still be here. Sorry, folks. Um, hopefully it will have responded to the, you know, the changing landscape, it will have tightened its mandate up a little bit and, and become a little more focused on what it does well and not trying to do everything for all people. I think the Globe and Mail will still be here. Um, but I think in terms of technology, we have no idea. I mean, 10 years ago, could you really have predicted the influence that Twitter has? It, it was a sort of niche back then. And now it's everything. TikTok didn't exist. Um, I think video is going to be an even bigger part of the equation than it is today. AI might replace with the, the little newsrooms that are left. Might well, just be AI and a couple of editors. Well, and, you know, the, the days of, of there being jobs for journalists and covering quarterly reports and, court, you, know, uh, you know, session info uh, calls with, with companies and, and doing the weather even, that's not necessary. AI will take all that low-hanging fruit, but maybe you can build a company, you being, you know, 16-year-old, whoever out there, on the back of AI and your own take on things, right? Like AI is a destroyer, it's also a creator. Um, and I think we don't really know what that's gonna look like yet. Um, you know, it may destroy us all, fingers crossed it doesn't. But I, but I do think whenever we look at technology, uh, we tend to think of the things that will break and not the things that, that it will make. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of making that could happen over the next little while. I hope it remains fact-based. I hope it doesn't play to our worst instincts. Um, but I, I have to be optimistic. Uh, it's just part of the way I'm wired. I think we see it strangely and remarkably similar. Well, Max, thank you very much for uh, joining us today and, uh, and sharing your perspective with us. Well, I can't believe I'm saying this, but it's a pleasure as always. <sighs> Weird. We <laughs> might actually have to do it again. Deal. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Uh, remember, if you're not yet a member of the Western Standard, go to westernstandard.news, click on membership. It's only $10 a year or uh, no. No, it's $99 a year or $10 a month for unlimited access to all Western Standard content. Thank you very much for joining us today and God bless. Canadian Shooting Sports Association. Without the CSSA, our gun rights would have been taken long, long ago. These guys are on the front lines helping to draft smart and intelligent firearms regulations and legislation in Canada. 
and more importantly, educating the public about how we keep guns out of the hands of the wrong people. You become a member, it's absolutely worth every penny. You can become a Western Standard member for just $10 a month or $99 a year for unlimited access.